Merry Christmas, guys. I know it's been a tough year and some circumstances prevented me from being here last year, but now we can just all sit down, relax, take a breather, and open some gifts. And seeing as how I have the Santa hat, I will pass them out. Nuts, you ghoul bitch. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, it's just me, the alternate universe version of you. I'm, I played Mario Odyssey and I get it. I'm not here to stop you from being a YouTuber or anything. I just came by to say happy holidays. Yeah, that's, that's totally why I'm here. Oh, okay. Did you get me anything? <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, okay, rude. Anyway, I'm gonna go first. Wow, the Nier Automata, Nier Gestalt, and Replicant vinyl box set. Thanks, Undertale Complete vinyl box set. I need to get out more. The evolution of music distribution over the past couple decades has been eventful, to say the least. That sounds like a really boring topic sentence to a subpar research paper, but stick with me here. With the introduction of digital media in the early 2000s, many people were happy to give up their cluttered piles of CDs after discovering they could download files of songs and own them forever. As the illegal distribution of said files became more and more prevalent, the music industry developed streaming services to regain control of the market. And while I can't deny that streaming services provide an amazing level of convenience and quality, there are some glaring issues. Most notable is the fact that streaming platforms devalue the content they provide. Spotify, for example, only pays around a third of a penny per stream, and this method of distribution further damages those trying to produce music independently. There's something disheartening, to me at least, about not properly supporting the artists I care about or never owning their music. Nowadays, the desire to own entertainment entertainment has become outdated, let alone own it in a physical format. So by the time video game music became prevalent enough to be published outside of the games themselves, collecting music in general had already receded into a niche hobby. But the people that enjoy collecting video game music pressed on the outdated format that is vinyl? We, um, we exist. It's more than just me. I hope. When it comes to the things I care about, I like seeing them tangibly. I suppose this may doometh me to the fourth circle of hell for being enchanted by mine worldly possessions, but I like knowing that if an online service were to go out of business, whether it be streaming or download, I could still listen to songs as long as I don't scratch the disc or record. That's on me. There isn't anywhere near the amount of demand for video game music to be sold in America as there is in Japan, where many soundtracks and even indie games see physical releases on store shelves. Almost every video game soundtrack I've purchased in the US has been from a company that produces them for a smaller audience, often as vinyl and in very limited quantities. But instead of continuing to write a research paper about the downfall of mainstream physical media, I want to talk about why I, along with a growing community of others, do collect more than just the games. Why the soundtracks specifically? I like to collect things that mean something to me. For most of my life, that's been the video games themselves. And maybe there was a year or two where acquiring 63 pieces of plastic was my top priority. But over the past few years, and especially after creating YouTube videos and diving deeper into every facet of this amazing medium, I've grown obsessed with video game soundtracks. An indie studio I fell in love with this year was Supergiant Games. After getting my socks knocked clean off by the high octane gameplay and rocking guitar riffs of Hades, I decided to blaze through the rest of Supergiant's library. Pyre's character writing and subtle uses of dynamic music made me cry, and Transistor's vocal themes just fucking kicked me while I was down. And then Bastion? <laughs> I could ramble on about countless examples of amazing music from just Supergiant's library for the rest of the video, but I figured it'd be more fun if I brought along someone a bit more familiar with these soundtracks than I am. 
in case some people are, are unfamiliar watching this video with who you are and what you do, can you give like a quick introduction? Sure, yeah. My name is Darren Korb, and I'm the audio director and composer for Supergiant Games. And uh, most recently, we released a game called Hades. The thing about composing music for games that makes it unique is how the listener is going to be interacting with the music. It's different from sort of any other medium in that it is interactive. The way a player experiences it or the duration for which a player will experience it is going to be different depending on how they're playing through the game. You have to kind of build that in to the piece or account for that in how you implement the piece somehow. So I think that's probably the main difference and challenge with composing for games. That being said, you know, the, the games that I've worked on with Supergiant, um, which is all the games I've worked on, have <laughs> have been really creatively free. It's been a lot of fun to really try and express the feeling of a particular place um, and, and setting through the music as, as much as I can. If it's punishment you want, how am I to say no? One of the reasons video game music resonates with me so strongly is that it helps memorialize my experience. Both for my job and on my own time, I play a lot of games, and as the years go by, I feel as if I don't remember as much about each game as I'd like. For games I played as a kid, I can recall some very specific experiences, but levels, gameplay, or story are often lost. Probably didn't help that I was awful at games and couldn't get very far in most of them, but I'll be damned if I don't remember that absolute jam that plays during cutscenes in Sonic Pinball Party for the Game Boy Advance. I remember evil tales like I lost to that dude yesterday because of that song. You're such a moron, son- Whoa! Tales would never say- that. For a more recent example, I first played Hollow Knight over three years ago. I didn't finish it, and I remember playing it at a time when I was fairly stressed. As time passed, I felt that I couldn't remember much from my playthrough, but I could always feel that I cared immensely about the game. Listening to the lonely, tragic pieces that accompanied me through the journey always felt like some sort of subconscious reminder, and upon recently starting a new playthrough, the feelings of absolute adoration have come flooding back as I fall in love with the experience all over again. Video games also find unique ways to incorporate music that can make songs feel interesting even after hearing them hundreds of times. There are countless examples of the unique possibilities when it comes to implementing dynamic music. Octopath Traveler uses character motifs to seamlessly transition from overworlds and cutscenes to battle music. Nier Automata implements a similar technique, designing several versions of each area theme to shift into battles and events without changing the musical bass. Hades and other roguelikes are great at tweaking music constantly depending on whatever's occurring, and Celeste uses instruments to represent each character and adapts each song based on your progression to encapsulate both story and level changes. Or how about Sayonara Wild Hearts, the game where music and gameplay fucking ran off, got married, and had a kid together? There are endless examples of this kind of thing, but basically, it's not just about having a soundtrack full of jams. It's about how you use them. I think how reactive it is to a player, uh, it can be to a player's experience and really feel like it's sort of a piece of music that is in real time responding to you in some way and reacting to the, the way in which you're playing through a sequence of a game. Uh, I think that's really fascinating about it. So, so in context, you know, I think that's what's something that's special about game music for sure. And I also appreciate the sort of creative range of game music that, that exists. I mean, the, the fact that you're sort of able to do anything that seems like, you know, or at least my approach is that anything that seems like it's it's just right for this setting and this place and anything that's gonna express that, you know, anything's fair game. There's no sort of requirement about what this needs to sound like.
What I'm getting at with all this is that music is probably the biggest takeaway from the games I play, as it serves a pivotal role in defining a game's entire style and identity. Hypnospace Outlaws wacky MIDI tunes immerse you in its fake internet universe, Valhalla lets you customize your perfect playlist before each night of cyberpunk visual novel bartending, and Lethal League Blaze wouldn't be Lethal League Blaze without the funky fresh beats. We all know music practically feels like black magic when it comes to connecting with your emotions, so pairing music with the interactive medium of video games is a match made in heaven. Or hell, I guess? I mean, it fits. There's something about experiencing the music in the context of a game that really uh, can make make you love it more. It's sort of like an unfair gateway to people's hearts, you know, <laughs> it's like they play a thing a million times and all, and they just happen to love the music, you know, they're playing a hundred hours of Final Fantasy or whatever, you know, oh, I love this theme music for some reason, I don't, can't imagine why, you know, it's just sort of burrowed its way into your heart. And so I, I feel sometimes that that as a composer, I have like a bit of an unfair pathway to, to people's, uh, you know, to endear the music to, to people. Uh, but um, I, I think it's a really interesting space because there's so much happening in it and so much different stuff happening creatively and people are bringing all sorts of different things to the table. So, you know, it's, it's a very cool, cool spot, I think. And besides, it's like the song goes. Till it's done. Even though video game music is only one piece of the massive multimedia puzzle that is a video game, it can mean just as much to those who play games as a song composed simply to be music might mean to someone else. We might have at least a little ways to go when it comes to appreciating music in the gaming industry at large. We knew this year that the Game Awards Orchestra wasn't going to be easy to pull off, but we had to try. I know how much we all love video game music. I know how much we all love video game music. Oh, do we now? Then why was Best Music and Score relegated to a 59-second segment the pre-show? I bet these guys didn't even know there's a dedicated hum button in Transistor. But what matters is that the players are continuing to recognize the importance of video game music every year. So so while we now understand why people love video game music, the question still remains, why do they want to collect it physically? Because despite being an incredibly niche hobby in the grand scheme of video games and pop culture, we're currently experiencing something of a physical video game music renaissance. But again, why on vinyl records of all options? There are these huge plastic discs that you gotta hold correctly so you don't scratch them and they wear over time just by playing them a lot and you gotta keep dust off of them by using a carbon fiber brush and keeping them sleeved on a shelf but when they're on the shelf you gotta make sure that they're not bending or placed incorrectly and the room isn't too hot otherwise they'll warp and when you're playing them you gotta keep an eye on the needle and you gotta Ooh, i bet that's the three lp pyre soundtrack i just ordered i'll be right back I think in the age of streaming and digital music and everything, having a sort of physical manifestation of the stuff you like is fun. And being able to sort of have a thing you can admire and touch and manipulate and, and just the act of sort of listening to an album is really satisfying because you can't just put it on and go about your business. You have to sort of come back in 20 minutes and flip it over and, you know, you can't, <laughs> you can't, you have to at the bare, at the bare minimum, you've got to come back and flip the record over. So. I think I really enjoy the sort of ritual of having to actively listen to, to something instead of just an infinite playlist of the whole internet, you know? <laughs> After asking Darren for his opinion on why physical music is making a resurgence, I realized that my own reasons for being so obsessed with collecting are exactly the same. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, some fans don't have much of a physical attachment to the games they play or most media in general, and that's totally understandable. It isn't cheap, nor is it, shall we say, space savvy to collect this kind of stuff. 
Do I have to register this as a weapon? But it's been uplifting to learn that there are plenty of other people, including the composers themselves, who see collecting in the same way I do. It's a way to further support the creators of the games I love while also having something tangible to hold and admire. After becoming so accustomed to playlists and streaming, listening to a full soundtrack in a more active manner like Darren mentioned is strangely enjoyable. I gotta pull it off the shelf, admire the cover art, carefully extract the record, put it on the turntable, dust it off, and lower the needle on. Physical video game soundtracks show the appreciation for the medium on both sides. You've got the passionate fans that want to collect something special, as well as the developers and composers, who care enough about the art they've created to help memorialize it further for a small percentage of their audience. Do you, do you find any like personal satisfaction on seeing your stuff get on like vinyl and CD? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's one of those things where it's like, it feels real, you know, when it's when it's finally like released and in a physical medium. It's like, oh, well, just, this is like the albums that I love, you know, it's like, wow, <laughs> that's cool. It's it's a milestone. And and before probably 2015 or 2016, I never even imagined that my music would be on vinyl because the vinyl thing didn't. That's kind of when it started hitting was like just before that it started coming back. I couldn't, if you had told me that, hey, you're going to have albums on vinyl, you know, like two years before that, I'd be like, that's silly. What are you talking about? Why would I have albums on vinyl? But it's, it's really cool. And then, you know, of course, I'm super excited about the releases coming up for the stuff that I recorded at Abbey Road that's going to be on vinyl. Like there's something, you know, special just, just the, going through a, not fully, you know, the same sort of process that the Beatles went through, but, <laughs> but sort of being able to kind of have it, yeah. Most publishers don't just slap some box art on a paper case and call it a day. Uh, one of my personal favorite aspects when it comes to video game vinyl is the artistry that goes into both the packaging and the records themselves. So I guess I might as well show off my collection. When it comes to cover art for single and double LPs, I'm a big fan of simplistic designs like Ori and the Will of the Wisps and Sayonara Wild Hearts, where the stars are given shimmering paint and the heart is given reflective material to make them stand out. On the exact opposite side, I also love the unique original artwork made for covers like the Undertale box set. And hey, what do you know? The Pyre vinyl by Darren Corb and Ashley Barrett of Supergiant Games illustrated by Gen Z looks beautiful as well. Digital downloads are almost always added as a nice little bonus, and some releases include liner notes, lyric sheets, and even full booklets with composer interviews and messages, which are always enjoyable to read and add an extra layer of personal value. And speaking of value, just show me a video game vinyl box set and I'll hand you all the money you want because man, box sets get the mega deluxe treatment. The art and packaging for the near replicant and near automata box set is Oh, it's so good! The Stardew Valley box set is jam-packed with details to reflect the game's theme. It's split into four records, one for each season, with each cover having its own Harvest-themed artwork and each record being colored accordingly. If they're gonna bleed me of every last dollar in my bank account, I'm glad they're doing it with some respect. And speaking of the records themselves, I would talk about them, but I actually have to include a short commercial break to pay for all of the pre-orders I'm still waiting on. Are you looking for deals on vi video game music? Come on down to the VGM Emporium. VGM stands for video game music, by the way. We got the traditional 180 gram vinyl for all you people that give a shit. <laughs> We got red vinyl, white vinyl, blue vinyl. God bless the truth. <laughs> oh, you don't like solid colors? Well, then do I have the product for something for you? I just got this one on sale. Celeste, Celeste. It's like somebody threw up on this one. Yeehaw. This one got the Hollow Knight face right on it. Face. Everything must go! When the missus finds out I spent $89.99 plus shipping and handling on a near complete vinyl box set, 
things are not gonna go over too well. I gotta get rid of all this crap by Sunday. We got three, count them, three JoJo soundtrack CDs. Wait a minute, these ain't video games, these is my sons. The Super Meat Boy CD. Signed by Danny Baranowski. Okay, well maybe not everything, let's go. Oh, you buy this one? I'll throw in the record brush. Whoa, I'm inside of the bargain tornado. Whoa. We put some cool like tornado. So come on down and get yourself some music because I do not want to think about how much money I have spent on all these. Well, we're back from our short commercial break, but for some strange reason, it feels like I'm all out of vinyls to talk about. While you can't exactly walk into a store and grab a video game CD or vinyl off the shelf, the growing fanbase for soundtracks hasn't gone unnoticed. More and more studios have been responding to the love fans have for their music by publishing soundtracks online. While not every soundtrack is available online, the selection across platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, and Bandcamp is pretty impressive. You can listen to anything from Devil May Cry 5 to Astro Bot Rescue Mission to- oh, would you look at that? All of the music Music by Darren Korb including the orchestral album he recorded at Abbey Road. Japanese studios have even started selling their music physically overseas. Square Enix sells official vinyls and CDs through their online store, and publishers like Sega, Capcom, Konami, and Sony have been partnering with merchandise companies to press anything from beloved classics like Sonic Adventure 2 and Castlevania to obscure handheld titles like Loco Roco. And as is tradition in every video I make, indie games get the highest praise when it comes to cherishing their own soundtracks. They may not always stack up with AAA titles popularity-wise, but their creators seem to be the most understanding when it comes to the importance of their own music. The composers or publishers will release the soundtracks to stream on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Music, for digital sale on Bandcamp and iTunes, and on every physical format imaginable, from CD to vinyl to cassette tape. I take one look at the Celeste cassette tape and the rational side of my brain says, I will never use this, it's going to collect dust. But that is quickly silenced by the child side that screams, Look, it's the, it's the fucking thing from the game! I think part of it is the fact that most of this type of game doesn't have a physical release, and it's a way to own a thing for the thing you like. In, in lieu of having a game disc or a game cartridge or something, you have this pretty, this beautiful, large format artwork that you get to put on your wall. And I mean, not everybody who buys the vinyl even has a record player to listen to it. Some people just like collecting them for the the beautiful artwork. And I get it. I mean, it's, it's cool. It looks, <laughs> it looks awesome. But you may have noticed that there's one key publisher I haven't mentioned in this entire video to keep the whole thing positive. That's because, despite being the company responsible for some of the most beloved video game music of all time, Nintendo... <clears throat> yeah. I can talk about all the music history I want, or put people to sleep rambling about all of the random trivia I know about video game soundtracks, or keep showing off my collection, but I think I've talked for long enough, so it's time to wrap things up. 2020 has been a pile of shit year for pretty much everyone, and video games have helped a lot of people get through it, myself included. I know I sound like a generic corporate social media post, but trust me, I'm a gamer. I wasn't kidding in my Animal Crossing video when I said video games are one of the main reasons I get out of bed in the morning. Hell, Hades might be a game about hell, but it, alongside Supergiant's other games like Pyre, places so much emphasis on the importance of family, friends, and relationships in general. And you can pet the three-headed dog! But games aren't always meant to be experienced alone. Playing online helps me connect with my friends in a time where in-person social interaction is pretty damn scarce. And the music? Well, it's literally made to bolster those moments. While people won't look back on the year itself very fondly, they'll definitely look back on the games they've played and the experiences they shared with others. Whether a song manifests as a triumphant, defining aspect of a video game or a perfectly blended, invisible backing track, I think there's zero doubt in anyone's mind that the interactivity of video games helps to truly elevate music in a way that's entirely unique, and that the songs from their favorite games 
games will stick with them long after they see the credits roll. I've talked about so much amazing video game music this year, from the hourly themes of Animal Crossing, to the emotional storytelling woven through Celeste's Farewell, to Japanese rhythm games, an exercise video game, a pop album video game, boss rush games, roguelikes, Mario and Sonic the Rio 2016 Olympic Games, and yes, the Mediterranean prog rock Halloween music of Hades. As a fresh but huge fan of Supergiant Games, I feel so lucky to have been able to chat with Darren Korb. It was easily one of the highlights of my entire year, and having a position as a creator where I can have access to that kind of opportunity, and hell, just being able to talk about what I love and see that hundreds of thousands of people care about the same things, no matter how obscure they may seem, it's a really cool feeling. So I'd like to give a huge thank you to Darren and to all of you for watching this video. I'm just doing the, the, the thing that I see in, in YouTube interviews sure. where they're like, all right, floor is yours. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, well, there's, uh, you know, Supergiant Games games. You know, we have four games. You can play those. <laughs> That's a thing. Uh, and the soundtracks are available. And, and you know, I've got, a, I've got a band called Control Group and working on a new album with them that's been kind of kicking around for a long time so hopefully that'll come out you know next year or something we'll see if you're new here and you enjoyed the video please consider subscribing and if you'd like to support me and the videos i make you can check out my patreon at patreon.com slash yakocmn or through the link in the description i'll be uploading the full interview with darren for my patrons and you can also get your name in the credits and access to exclusive monthly videos where i review games share behind the scenes content and chat about my creative process as strangely inefficient as it may seem to collect modern music pressed on such an outdated format seeing my favorite soundtracks makes me smile like a big dumb idiot. Out of all the things I collect, video game records are definitely the most bizarre, but whether it's the beautiful cover art, the specially designed or colored records, or just watching the vinyl spin while listening to the music, this hobby and supporting video game composers in general is one of the most comforting feelings I've found as of late. And now, to perfectly finish off this video by tying together everything about the magic of video game music, physical collecting, supporting artists, and most importantly, to thank Darren Korb, I can officially add the Songs of Supergiant Games orchestral vinyl signed by the man himself to my collection live on video. What a great end to the year. We experienced unforeseen production delays such that we now have a new ship date of early 2021. Call Darren back. I cannot have 2020 end like this. I said call him back. I'm not mad at Super Giant. I love Super Giant. I'm upset with the world. I can't believe I was this unlucky. I've been planning this specific ending since I pre-ordered the soundtrack back in August. You think I could like mail him a piece of paper and he'd autograph it or something?